Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a very long lecture today. I hope I, I fit it in 15 minutes. If not, then we're going to continue in the session. But the reason why it's long, because I want to take my time to just explain to you all the equations that we're going to discuss today, which is basically bending stress, bending strain, and hopefully we'll be able to draw the stress distribution. But before going through, like before going in, in today's class, I just again want to review what we did before so you're able to connect everything together. So we started the semester with a beam and we applied axial load and with that axial load the beam elongated or shortened, right? And that was the strain. And when we spoke about the stress for the axial load, the stress was uniform, which is, was basically force over area. So the cross section, the whole cross section felt the same stress. So if I'm pulling this beam, the whole cross section here felt this axial stress. And then when we moved to the torque, and we know that the torque may, like applied a shear stress on the beam, so the torque applied twisting, and then the stress distribution itself of the cross section wasn't uniform. Unlike uniform stress for the axial stress, for shear stress, due to torque, it wasn't uniform. What I mean with uniform is it, the whole cross section didn't feel the same stress. Because when we derived the equation, which is tau is equal to tr over j, we found that the stress depends on the r or the radius, which is if we are, if we want to calculate the stress at the center, the r would be zero. That's why the stress is zero. And we want to calculate the stress at the perimeter of that circle, we put the radius equal to r. That's why we had the high, high stress at the ends. Anywhere in the middle had like a short distance or like a very small distance. That's why tau was dependent on the r. In different words, the stress distribution here wasn't uniform, which means it wasn't constant. Not all the points within the cross section felt the same stress. The further the points, the higher the stresses. That's why we call it non-uniform. In today's lecture, we're going to speak about transverse loads. And I introduced the, the wording for transverse load before, which is the loads that's perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the beam. So where is the longest dimension of the beam, which is the length? The axis of that length, that's the longitudinal axis. So if you have a load that is perpendicular to that longitudinal axis, like these loads, we call them we call these loads transverse loads. And this transverse loads, when we apply this transverse load on the beam, <coughs> it's going to bend the beam. It's not going to twist them. It's not going to elongate it or shorten it. It's going to twist, sorry, it's going to bend it. And another word for bending here is flex it. So it's going to either blend, so it's, it's going to bend and flex, because bending has another expression, which I'm going to use interchangeably here, is called flexure. So bending, flexure, same meaning. Bending stress, flexure stress, same meaning. OK? And again, I'm going to continue reviewing, because this is important just to understand what do we mean when we draw the internal force diagram, like shear force diagram, bending moment diagram, axial force diagram, internal torque diagram. What, what, what does that mean compared to when we do the stresses equation? Simply, when we do have a beam like this, and we applied transverse loads, or we applied torques, when you all draw the shear force diagram, bending moment diagram, you didn't care what the cross section looked like. You just simply sum the, you just simply look where the force is, go up with the force, go down with the force, follow the sign convention. But when you drew the internal force diagram, you didn't care what the cross section looks like, neither the material. So what we care, and it's important, about this side, which is the internal force diagram, the internal force diagram tells you the internal force at any point within the beam length. And then later, when you identify for each diagram in the shear or bending moment or torque or axial force, when, when you identify the peaks or the maximum internal forces, that's when we move to the stress. And the stress here doesn't tell you what the whole length feels. 
No, the stress, we focus on a certain points within the beam length. So internal force diagram, it tells you what the whole beam length feel. So any point within the beam length, I can tell you what, what the shear looks like. But when we talk about stresses, we focus only on the single point, on the maximum shear, for example. So for the first diagram, I notice that the shear is at point A. So I'm going to take this point A, and now I'm going to study the stress for that. You didn't take this equation yet, but the whole point that I'm trying to convey here, which is at a certain point within the beam length, that's where we focus on the stress. Okay? And that's when, in the stress equation, we include, okay, what does the shape look like? What is the property of the shape? And then when we want to design the shape, we compare it with, the, for example, tau allowable. And you remember from lecture two, tau allowable, we get it from the stress strain, which is at the yield, for example. So in the stress calculation, we focus on the area, we focus on the material, and that doesn't tell you like the whole beam length. No, it, it is at a certain location. At x equals certain location within that beam. Same as for bending moment, same as with the shear stress due to torsion before. Shear stress due to torsion, this is what we did. Tr over j. This T, which is the internal torque, and this internal torque was the maximum of that diagram, and then we used it to get the shear. To summarize, internal force diagram for the whole beam length, stresses, any stress is for a certain point within the beam length. And within that certain section within the beam length, we take a cross section, so the cross section will look rectangular like this. So the shear stress tells you what is the point at a certain distance in a beam feel. So, for example, this is what we did in the shear stress. When we say Tr over J, this R is a distance, is a radial distance within the cross section. So within that point from the whole length of the beam. And using this, we can tell the stress distribution within the cross section itself, which within a certain distance in the whole beam length. Is that clear to everyone? Any questions? OK. Let's move to today's, today's topic. And I'll start with bending strain. So if I do have a beam that's originally like this, before applying any loads, the beam not going to deflect or deform or anything. But when we start applying transverse loads, and now I'll be careful starting from now on to use the right expression for the loads. When we apply transverse loads, the beam going to bend like this. OK? And we all, we all practice and agree that the upper part of the beam, since it's shrink it or like like shortened in length that's going to be in compression and the lower part going to be in tension but the thing is it starts with the upper part in compression and then it went to tension so there is a transition that happened here so for that section for example that section within that beam length the top part experienced compression, and the bottom part, for example, experienced tension. So there is at some point in a beam, in that section, that the transition happened. And by transition, I mean there is a conflict, or like a, a turning point, or a conflict, a conflict point where the stress changed from tension to compression. So it passed through a zero stress, which means there is a point within that cross section, and within all the cross section within that beam, that neither felt tension or compression. And in that 2D, we call that line now, because this line passed through all the cross-section within that beam, we call it neutral axis. And the short form for that is NA. So I'm not going to write neutral axis again. I'm, I'm always going to write NA. So within that line, this line is called neutral axis. It's the line where the beam didn't feel neither tension or compression. If it didn't feel tension or compression, that means the stress at that line is equal to zero, and therefore the strain at that line is equal to zero. And if I want to show you this in 3D, so in 2D it's look like a line, but in 3D it's a plane. So it's a plane that goes through the beam, 
at certain distance that we don't know yet. We're going to derive it in this lecture, and we're going to find where its location is. And this is what we call now, in the 3D, it is called neutral surface. OK? OK, I'm not going to write definition for the sake of time. But when I upload the lecture notes, you will find all the definitions. But the definitions, I'm going to say it verbally. So if you were able to write it down, that's fine. If you're not, don't worry. I'm going to write everything for you when I upload the PDF version. OK? So that's the neutral axis. So now, from, from, from this beginning of the lecture, I'm going to tell you I don't know where the neutral axis is. But for the fact, I know that the transition happened between compression and tension. That's why I know there is a neutral axis. That's why at the beginning here, I just assumed it anywhere within that beam section. I didn't identify its location yet. OK? So let's start with the first step of finding the bending strain. We know the axial strain. We know the shear strain from the previous lecture. Now let's go through the bending strain. What I'm going to do here from the previous slide, I'm going to take this section. I'm going to take this guy out, which is before applying the load. The beam looked like this. So this is what I'm going to call delta x. After applying the load, this same delta x bent like this. OK? So I'm going to take this these two guys out in the next slide, and, and I'm going to study them. OK? This is what I drew here. So at the beginning, before applying any load, I know for a fact that the neutral axis is somewhere within the beam height. It's called neutral axis. And at a distance y from a neutral axis, and I'm calling it y, it's a variable, which means I'm going to take any distance from y. But let's do this distance, which is y. And I know before applying any loads, this new line that I want to study, which is this green line, which is this line, the length for that line was delta x. After applying a load, the beam bent. And still I have the neutral axis. And by definition, the neutral axis didn't experience any elongation or shortening. But the line underneath it, which I wanted to study, it does experience elongation. That's why the new length of that line, I'm going to call it delta x dash. OK? So under transverse loads, the beam deform into a shape of a circular arc, which is what you see here. And if I do have a circular arc, if I extended those lines, those lines are going to intersect in the center of the arc, or the center of the curvature. OK? Did I lose anyone? Did I lose anyone, or everything is clear? OK. So I do have a center of the curvature. And then from the center of curvature to the neutral axis, there is rho. And rho here is the radius of curvature. OK? And then I do have a theta inside. And this is the angle of the arc. OK? Angle of the arc. OK, now let's drive the, the bending strain due to transverse loads. And I'm going to start with the general form of strain. And you all know that the strain is equal to delta L over L naught, which is the change in length over the original length. And the reason why I used this equation, I didn't use the shear, the shear strain equation because I want you to answer that question. Due to bending moment, or the bending moment will cause a normal stress or shear stress. So I see shear. Let me, let me draw something for you. And hopefully, you're going to 
get it. So this is the beam cross section. OK? Do you all see it? So this is the beam cross section. And I apply the bending moment like this. And if I broke up this bending moment, bending moment is basically a couple. Right? Which also tells you, when I apply a bending moment like this, like this, the upper side of the cross section is going to feel compression. The lower side is going to feel tension. So I'm going to repeat the question again. Is that shear stress or normal stress? Again, again, shear. So shear is when the force is parallel to the cross section. But what's happening here? Is the force parallel to the cross section or is it like perpendicular to the cross section? It causes the upper side to be compressed and the lower side going to be tension. Do you see this? Raise your hand if you have questions. Okay, bending moment now will cause the normal stress or shear stress? Do I hear shear stress? You all convinced? Okay, that's why when I'm when I proposing the strain here, I'm not, I'm not saying the shear strain equation, which has the gamma and all this kind of stuff. No, I'm using this normal stress, norm, sorry, normal strain equation, which is delta L over L naught. What is the line that I was studying? I was studying that line, which was originally delta x, and after bending, it was delta x dash. So delta L, which is L final minus L initial. So L final here is delta x dash. L initial is delta x. L note, which is, which is L initial, is delta x. OK? Using the properties of the arc, I want to have this arc, or this delta x, in terms of rho and theta. But let me add something. I already told you the line that I'm studying is at distance y from the neutral axis. So when I bend it here, this line is still at the distance y from the neutral axis. So delta x, which is going to be the neutral axis, because again, we agreed that the neutral axis didn't change, didn't elongate nor shorten. That's why it still has its original length, which is delta x. So now let's relate this delta x and make it a function of theta and rho. If you remember properties of arc or, or curvatures, if I do have a curve like this with phi and the radius of rho, and you have delta x. So delta x, do you agree with me? It is equal to the radius times theta or no? OK. So delta x is equal to phi times theta. What about delta x dash? Phi times what? Rho plus y. Beautiful. Beautiful. OK. Let's continue. Delta x dash is going to be rho plus y times phi minus delta x, which is only rho times phi or phi or the theta over rho times theta. What can I cancel in this equation? No, the phi only. One minute, rho will be canceled. You're right, but one minute. I'll cancel phi with the phi because as if I'm taking phi or theta common at the top. So when I take it common, it's going to cancel the bottom. So let's break up this equation now. And I'm going to have phi, sorry, rho plus y minus rho over rho. You're going to find that the rho at the top will cancel each other. So I will end up with the shear strain now is equal to y over radius of curvature. And this is the bending strain. OK? And for now, let's say, because that's what we assumed, y is a distance from neutral axis to the point where you want to calculate the strain at. So y is a distance from the neutral axis 
to any point where we want to calculate the strain at, whether it's down or up, okay? Rho here, which is the radius of curvature, it is, let me call it radius of curvature, and let's take some, some time now just like to get the meaning of rho intuitionally, okay? So when we applied, when we applied load, which is the moment, we had a row like this. So as if this is the part that I took out of the beam. When I apply the low, a row, uh, so I apply the load, a bending moment, and I apply the very large bending moment, the beam gonna bend like this. What is happening to the row? So the row is gonna be from here to here, right? So when I have a large bending moment, I do have a very small row, okay? But when do I, when, when I have a very low bending moment or very low load or barely no load, what's happening to the R? R is increasing, right? So if R is increasing, that means the strain is decreasing, which makes sense or no? Okay, again, if I have a very big load, very strong load, the R, the radius of curvature is very small. And when the radius of curvature is very small, what's happening to the strain? So big, because like they're inversely proportional, right? When you increase the row, you're reducing the strain. So I hope this makes sense. And from what I said now, what do you think, because I didn't define row yet, what do you think the row depends on? Okay. On the load, so on the magnitude of the moment. If I do have, if I change the shape of the beam, will that, will that, will that take part in resisting the bending or no? which is, in other terms, the moment of inertia. Do you agree with me? Yeah. And the last thing, do you think the material is going to govern or no? If I have a foam like this and I bend it, is it the same if I bend the steel with the same load? No. So the row now depends on three things. The row depends on the E, which is the material. Depends on the moment of inertia, which is the property of area that resists the bending. And finally, the bending moment, the magnitude. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So here I should have wrote the equation, so never mind. So now we know the bending strain. So now let's jump to bending stress. So you already answered that question. So bending moment causes what kind of stresses? You already answered. And I hope you all convinced that's a normal stress. Okay. So let's go ahead and derive a bending stress equation. We already derived the bending strain. So bending stress, we all agree that if I do have an internal bending like this on the cross section, so, and I'm assuming the neutral axis somewhere here. I'm, I'm assuming it in the middle, but it's not necessarily be in the middle because I haven't yet told you its location. So, if I do have a bending moment and I broke up this bending moment, bending moment is being broken to couple, right? Which is what you see here. But since I told you that the whole upper part gonna feel compression, that means I do have a very small DFs, which is a very small loads. And this is applied this way, which as if it's pushing the upper side. And in the lower side, since it's bending like this, the lower side it's want to be in tension. That's why there is like a very small DFs. And by saying DFs, I do have like as very small forces. Okay. So when I have a very small DFs, this DFs combinedly, if I integrated everything in here, I'm going to get this bending moment. So let us continue by saying, okay, you know what? Now we just, I just convinced you that all these forces causes normal stress, not shear stress. So let's see what the normal stress equal. So the general normal stress equation from Hooke's law, stress is equal to E times strain. Right? Did I lose you? I didn't lose you, right? Okay. I don't want anyone to lose hope. Okay? Okay. I'm going to remove this strain, and I'm going to put Y over rho, which I'm going to name this equation just for referencing it later, equation number one. So 
I'm going to remove this elastic, so I'm going to remove this strain, and I'm going to put instead a stress is equal to E Y over rho, which also tells me that now the stress is function the stress now is function of y. And again, to remind you what y was, that was the distance from the neutral axis to any point that you want to calculate the stress at. And again, it does make sense. Because I told you in the middle, I do have a neutral axis, which is a location that's neither tension or compression, so the stress is equal to 0. So when y equal to 0, which implying that we are at the neutral axis, that's, that's if y equals 0, that's when the stress is equal to 0. Right? So now I'm having this equation. I'm going to name this equation equation number 2. Okay? But again, I didn't answer some questions, which is, okay, you didn't tell me what rho equals. You told me that the rho is function of E, I, and moment. But I don't have, like, a, any physical equation. So let's continue doing this. I know a lot of integration, but I, I do have a point here of showing you everything. I already told you in a moment that... The bending moment gonna cause the bending moment gonna cause the upper part to be compression, the lower part means be tension, which implies that I have a lot of like all these small DFs, which is small forces. And if I focus on two of them, for example, if I focus on that force, which is I'm gonna have it in orange, and this force has been applied, so this is DF is an applied on, let me do a different color. This is D area, and do we have D force, okay? And we do have a distance Y here. This very small DF that I'm focusing on now, on like spotting the light on right now, this is what I'm gonna focus on, okay? You all know, that due to these two loads that I'm focusing on, DF and this DF, this is going to make couple. And I'm going to call this couple DM. And if I integrated all the DMs for all these forces, that's how I'm going to get the big moment. OK? Is that clear to everyone? OK. Let's now do integration of all the couples, which is all the DMs, over that cross-section area, that's how I'm going to get the big bending moment, right? If I integrate all these small forces, all these small forces are going to make a couple, and if I integrated all the couples, that's how I end up with the big bending moment, okay? And this bending moment is also an integration of the summation of all these DFs times Y. So, what I'm proposing now, I'm going to say integration of all the DFs times distance y, that's going to give me all the bending moment, which is I'm going to integrate all these D forces times y, and the y here is going to be variable. OK? So, and I want to pose, and I want to define what was DF. DF is a stress times area, D area. That's not hard. You all know that stress is equal to force over area. So force is equal to stress times area. So I'm going to say integration instead of DF now, I'm going to remove the DF and put stress D area times Y. And I'm going to bring the equation number two and put it in that equation. So I'm going to remove this stress. I'm going to remove this stress. And I'm going to put E rho over Y. So E rho, E over rho times Y. And then I do have another Y, D area. Finally, the bending moment which is this bending moment. And if I do have this neutral axis, which is, for example, x-axis, I do have the x-axis this way. So this bending moment is mx, which is m over x. 
And E over rho, I'm going to pull them out from the equation because E is constant. Rho is the radius of curvature, and the radius of curvature for a cross section is constant. And I'm going to end up with integration y square d area. And I want all of you now to tell me what is that? Inertia. Inertia about what? So I told you why. Beautiful. So mx now is equal to e over rho times ix. Now, we derived what is the rho equal, which is the radius of curvature. Radius of curvature now is equal to ei over m. So now we have a physical equation for rho. And, but we don't have a physical equation now for stress. What I do have for stress is e over rho times, times y. But I don't see any moment in that equation. It's just like relating the stress with some constant y. I want to, I want to continue find what is the stress in terms of moment equal. That's why, which is, which is we already hit there, I'm going to put the moment in terms of mx over ix is equal to e over rho. And let me call this equation 3. OK? Lastly, which is the moment that you've all been waiting for, <laughs> equation number 2. So I'm saying from equation number 2. And equation number 2 was equal to stress is equal to e over rho times y. And mem equation number three, which is mx over ix equal to e over rho. So what you notice here, that I do have e over rho and e over rho. And now the bending stress, which is here, I'm going to say bending stress. I'm going to remove e over rho. And I'm going to put mx over ix times y. And here is the bending stress equation. So the bending stress equation, it is m, uh, my over i. And the moment here is the internal moment around x, moment around x. And y is distance from neutral axis, again, to the point within the cross section where you want to find the calculate the stress at, to the point in the cross section where we want to calculate the stress. And finally, Ix is equal to moment of inertia around x. I've been always telling you since the beginning of this lecture that y is distance from the neutral axis to the point. But again, I don't know where the neutral axis is. And I'm going to refute that in a moment. And I'm going to change all the neutral axis in the next slide. But you all have been following with me how I derived that equation, because you, it's important to know how everything came from. So now let's just build an intuition here. So bending stress is directly proportional with y, which means if I do have a cross section like this, and here I do have a neutral axis, and y is calculated from the neutral axis. So at neutral axis, y is equal to 0. At the further points here, you have a maximum um, bending stress. OK? And the bending stress is inversely proportional with i which tells you the larger the i, which is the larger the resistance to bending, the lower the stress. OK? So at the further points here, at the further points, I'm going to call these points, for example, A and B. So A and B, so stress at A, if I want to find the stress at A, I'm going to say my over i. And sometimes, instead of y, we use a different wording for y, which is c. So I can say mc over i. c is also the distance from the centroid to the point where you want to calculate the stress at. mc over i. 
But you know that the C now, it's going to be h over 2, given that the whole height of the beam is h. So from the centroid, or from the neutral axis to the further point, it is h over 2. That's why I will have the maximum bending here, bending stress here. And let me, for completeness, just add a bending moment. And this is the mx. Tell me. Give me five minutes, and I'm going to prove it to you. OK? I'm not going to leave you lost. I'm going to uh, hopefully you will leave this lecture under so everything, hopefully. So just for completeness, I added a bending moment here. And this bending moment, and I've been trying to program you to draw this bending moment that way just to tell you that the arrow looks at the compression side, which is now easy for you to just get that the upper side is in compression if you drew the curve that way. If you drew the curve warping towards the beam, the arrow tells you where is the compression. So the arrow, if we look it up, so that means the upper side is in compression. So now, if I want to draw the stress for that beam, the stress distribution. And when I say the stress distribution, or even I mention stress, that's mean you know this is at, a, at some point within the beam length, this is the cross section that we are studying. So at stress equal A, we're going to get the maximum stress, for example. So the stress is going to be something like this. OK, I'm just drawing in 3D. You're not going to draw in 3D. I'm going to draw it in 2D now. And at the bottom here, a stress B is equal to MC over I, and C here is equal to H over 2. By explaining to you at the beginning and trying to have you draw the bending moment like this, we don't need to add the positive or negative at the beginning of the moment. Because this positive or negative tells you whether it's tension or compression. But once you draw the bending moment the right way, you can easily identify whether this, the up part is in tension or compression by looking at the arrow of the bending moment. The arrow tells you the upper side is in compression and the lower side is in tension. OK? This is in 3D. And 3D is a hard to read. That's why I'm going to draw it in 2D, which is as if I'm focusing on that. I'm looking at it that way. I'm looking at, I'm looking at that beam from this direction. So I'm standing here, and I'm looking at it that way. I can't see this side. So if I'm looking that way, and this is what we're going to do, I will draw this line, and this line represent that line, for example, or any line within the cross section. Because if you notice, any point here feels the same stress. Because the stress only depends on y. It doesn't depend on the other dimension. It depends only on the vertical dimension, not horizontal. So any point within y, within the beam, it's going be, to feel the same stress. So now if I want to draw the stress distribution, at this further point, I'm going to have something like this. And if you notice, the stress should equal to 0 at the neutral axis. So here, mc over i, and this is, I'm going to call it maximum. And at the bottom here is mc over i, and I'm also going to call it maximum. At the top, I do have negative. At the bottom, I do have positive. So the top, why it's, it's negative? Because the bending moment is applying compression the other side and tensioning in the lower side. Look at my hand. So if my hand going like this, there is a force that's pulling it. And if my hand going that way, there's a force that's pushing it. That's why the upper side in compression, the lower side is in tension. OK. Now I want to locate where the neutral axis is. So neutral axis, by definition, is where the stress is equal to 0. And if you, if you remember, the stress is, so the stress is acting on an area D, I mean, for an area DA, so if I have a stress here, on an area DA, that is resulted from a force, right? So let me put it in a different way. If I do have a stress here, this stress is a resultant from a force over an area. Is that right? And if I'm telling you, I want to find the location where the whole stress is equal to zero, and the stress is, if you know, 
that is stress is resulted from a force over area. And you know that this whole cross section is nothing but forces that is due to the bending moment, which is forms as a couple. Now, what I'm proposing here to get the neutral axis at the I want to find the neutral axis, which is the, at the stress is equal to zero, and the stress is a resultant from a force over an area. I want to find, I want to set summation if x is equal to zero. If you don't get what I mean, remember what we did before. If I did have a beam, and I applied multiple loads within the beam span, and you, make a, you made a cut here, and with that cut, with that cut, I do have like, I will take these loads in, but I don't have any, I don't have any axial loads. What I do have due to these loads, I'll do have a bending moment, M, and I do have a shear. And the reason why it was useless at that part time during, for example, the in-class assignment and the lecture to put the N, because although I do have a moment and I do have a shear, but do I see any axial loads? I don't see any axial loads. Therefore, when you did summation of x, n was always equal to 0. That is the same thing what I'm proposing here. Within that cross section or within that beam, I only see bending moment. I don't see any axial loads. I don't see anything. The axial that you might see here is just a, a I just broke up this moment to couples. But if you know, when I break up a moment to a couple, I do have a force. In opposite direction, same magnitude. So when you take, again, summation of x, what is going to be equal to? Zero. Are you all convinced? Any question? So if I'm saying that the summation of x equal to zero, then I want to integrate. I'm sorry, this is the last integration. So beautiful. I'm kidding. I, I don't like integration, though, but like. It's important just to show you where everything came from in case you want to generate on that. OK? So I want to say, I want to, I want to set the integration of all the df is equal to 0. So if I'm saying summation fx is good, then the integration of all the dfs is going to be equal to 0. And the df, which is the force, is equal to stress times area. Right? So I'm going to continue with that integration. A stress d area is equal to 0. And then I'm going to break up the stress using equation number 2, which is I'm going to get integration e over rho times y d area. e over rho for a cross section is equal. And then this equation need to be equal to 0. So at the location of the neutral axis where the stress is equal to 0, this equation needs to be equal to 0, which is e over rho times integration y d area is equal to 0. e cannot be equal to 0. e is constant. Rho cannot be equal to 0 because when we apply moment, rho needs to have a value. So this term, which is integration y d area, needs to equal to 0. And what was that? What's that? No, no, no. Integration, y, d area. What was that from the last lecture? First what? First moment of area. OK. And here's the, the interesting part. And when was the first moment of area is equal to 0? Not at the neutral axis. No, it wasn't at the neutral axis. When was the first moment of area is equal to 0? At the centroid. Right? If you, don't, if you don't agree with me, what was the equation for y bar? y bar is equal to integration y d area over integration d area. And if the integration y d area is equal to 0, that means the whole y bar is equal to 0. That means the distance from the centroid to the neutral axis now is equal to what? 0. That means for pure bending, for pure bending moment, the neutral axis coincides with the centroid. So what I'm going to go back now in the lecture, and I wish he'd stay because this is the important part. 
what I'm gonna do for all the y, for all the y here, so the y is not the centroid, for, not the distance from the neutral axis, is gonna be the center from the distance from the centroid. You might argue with me, and this is your right, that at the beginning we assumed, we didn't know where the neutral axis is, that's why we theoretically know at some point within the beam length, beam thickness, or beam height, there is a line where there is no tension or compression, that's why we assumed it here. And we based all our calculation based on that. And based on that, we derived all these equations, and then when we wanted to find where the neutral axis location was, we found it at the first moment of area is equal to zero, which you know from the previous lecture, that the first moment of area will be equal to zero at the centroid. That's why for pure bending, for pure bending, the neutral axis aligns or like coincides with the centroid. But when we in the next lecture introduce another combined loading, which is axial forces and all these kind of loads, the neutral axis is no longer gonna coincide with the centroid. Is that clear? So all the Ys, which is what you missed, What's your name? Linden, right? Okay, what you missed is the neutral axis, so the first moment of area is equal to zero, that means the neutral axis coincides with the centroid. So change all the Y definition that we have here from neutral axis to centroid. So Y is a distance from the centroid to any point where you want to calculate the stress at. And for pure bending, where we have a cross section with only bending moment, the neutral axis coincide with the centroid. Now, in the last three minutes, let me do an example. I do have this beam with that cross section, three, four meters, 5.8 millimeter, sorry, 5.8 kilonewton meter per meter, and I do have this cross section. I want to draw the bending moment, and if you remember, quickly, let's draw the bending moment, which is gonna be, I'm gonna start with zero, because there is no moment at the beginning, there is no moment at the end, and then there will be a parabola like this. And the value of that parabola, which is in the middle here, I'm having WL squared over eight, which is the magic formula that we concluded before. So 5.8 times four squared over eight, that is equal to 11.6 kilonewton meter. So, this bending moment, and given that the horizontal axis is Z, is that, what is that M? So this is M about Z or M about Y? Okay, this is M about Z. So now I know the M about Z is equal to 11.6. So what I did now, using the internal force diagram, which is bending moment diagram, I found the bending moment throughout the beam length, and I took the peak, which is the maximum moment. And now I'm gonna take this section out and move to the section level. Section level, I do have this beam, and for pure bending moment, I don't have any axial loads here, it's just bending moment. You know, from the integration that we did, that the centroid aligned with the neutral axis, that's why I made this line. Okay, so, I am only interested now in calculating the stress at the top and at the bottom, because that's where I have the maximum bending stresses. So let's say, MA, which is stress here, is MC over I, moment is 11.6, C, which is one, 120 millimeter, but 11.6 was kilonewton times meter, so I'm gonna apply this by thousand, over I. And IZ now, because I have MZ, is parallel to Z, perpendicular cube over 12, so 140 times 240 cube over 12. And that's gonna be equal to 8.63 megapascal. Last thing, which is what we practiced before, the bending moment, this is the beam. If we draw the bending moment up, that means the upper side or lower side in compression? The top side, because we draw the moment in the compression side, which means for this cross section, at that location, the upper side is gonna be compression. So a stress at A, I'm gonna put a negative sign here. Because you know, and we practiced that before, this is MZ. We're gonna draw it that way, because the moment is up, so the arrow is up. 
and arrow tells me where the compression is. And a stress, yeah, I'm, I'm 8.50 already, but give me one minute. The stress at B, it is the same MC over I, same moment, same C120, same I, so it's gonna be also 8.63. But the difference is the lower side is in compression, now, sorry, in tension now, that's why we put positive. Let's draw the stress distribution, which we call bending stress distribution here, at point A, as if this line that I drew is our reference line, and we're gonna draw the stress relative to that line. So this is our zero. So, and let's assume that if we went to the left, to the right, it's in tension. If we went to the left, it's in compression. I don't care if you flip them, it doesn't matter. As long as in the drawing itself, you draw the sign. So stress at A, it is 8.63, negative or positive, negative. So I'm gonna go that way. So this is 8.63. And at, at point B, which is down here, the stress was equal to 8.63, which is at the positive side. Make a line between them. And here is your stress. I don't care if you flip the diagram, I don't care as long as you put inside the diagram the sign, which tells me the upper side is in compression, so I put a negative here. The lower side is in tension. And this is the stress distribution, which also tells you at any point here in the diagram, for example, this top point, any point at the top part here, not only A, any point at a distance Y, which is a distance of 120, it's gonna feel 8.63. If I ask you, what is the stress at any point here, for example, and I gave you the Y, the distance, you either use the, calculation, the equation to get that stress or just read from the diagram. If I gave you that Y, use a similar triangle to get me that stress. So any point in that Y distance does have that same stress. Is that clear to everyone? Any questions? Okay, I'll see you tomorrow.